Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. Hey, John. How are you? I'm good. It's episode 120. Yes, it is. We had an email from a, a fellow podcaster who had not really looked at the uh, rundown and said, it's so impressive that you've got 120 episodes and I'd write back and say, I, well, yeah. <laughs> you have to correct everybody, John. Can't you just let it roll? I don't want to be that 120 guy. episodes. Yes. Well, there's lots really of- mean? 12? Does that mean 12 episodes? No, it's no. more than that. It's uh, season one, episode 20. So it's, you know, that's not bad. 20 episodes. Oh, 20 episodes. Yeah. It's yeah. Really not as good as 120 episodes, but, but we will, we'll get, Certainly well, we are, and, and we'll get there eventually. Anyway, um, that means it's chapter 19 of The Ambitious Card. We are getting down to the end of that book. And we have an amazing guest this week. The one, the only Tina Leonard. She In, is so great. She is just she is. so great. And she's perfectly positioned in this episode because in our last chapter, chapter 18, uh, Eli had to work with Harry to put together an act kind of overnight and to explore that idea of creating a routine, get all the dots you need to connect to make it happen. I don't think there's a better person to talk to than Tina Leonard. Yeah, she has really traveled the world with that one routine, the mop man routine. She's honed it. She's refined it. It's like a diamond. I don't know if I've told you this, John, or we've talked about this on the podcast before, but uh, there's a fella in town who refurbishes films for channels like the History Channel and things like that. And he has access to a bunch of old vaudeville performers that he has their films and has refurbished them. And so every once in a while, he'll have a little party and we'll watch 20 or 30 of these incredible performers, things that you would never see. And, and essentially they have five to seven minutes of something incredible and that's all they've got. And it's all they needed back in those days. And Tina kind of is like that. I mean, she's got this incredible 10 minutes and she may never need to come up with anything else. Cause it's just, it's so darn perfect. Yeah. She has come up with other things, including a, a, I was going to say really unique, but I'm not going to modify unique, a no. unique linking rings routine that um, apparently the first time she did it for her husband, Mike Caveney, he looked at her and said, what, did you just break my linking rings? <laughs> because she had done something that he'd never seen anybody else do with the rings. So maybe at some other point, we'll talk to her about that. Um, we've got video of her performing uh, Mop Man uh, as a link in the show notes. Currently, it's a link uh, to future listeners. YouTube can be quite uh, capricious. Is that the word? Ooh, I uh, like that word. Like the way Amazon changes book prices without asking, uh, YouTube will often pull things down for apparently no reason. But right now we've got a, a link to her uh, performing Mop Man. You may want to just pause us and go watch it because everything will make a little bit more sense if you've seen her do it. And if for some reason the link isn't there, uh, just do a search for Tina Leonard. That's L-E-N-E-R-T and Mop Man and you'll find it. It's indelibly etched because it is so perfect and so wonderful. And uh, when we talk to her, hearing her sort of break it down and all of the pieces and how it came about and a conversation with this magician made this happen. And then this conversation with that magician, I added this little piece. But what a delight to watch this woman work. It's just so much fun. If you, if you still have not stopped this podcast to take a look at Mop Man in the notes, go do it because everything will make much more sense to you as we talk to her, if you've seen what she does. Particularly when you hear about her journey, because she uh, had an interesting entry into the world of magic. She didn't come in the way most people do. Uh, in fact, Tina actually asked our first question for us before we even got to it. How did I get into magic? Exactly. Um, quite by accident, actually. I was a mime. I was actually a street mime at the time making a transition like it was a street mime but some nice work was coming in some television work some commercials and definitely par private parties as a mime mime was starting to not be so cool anymore this would be in the early 70s when it, there was almost a mime movement so to speak and but there was too many mimes out on the street and it was getting really difficult so all the when i started it was a brand new thing people weren't used to seeing a mime performing on the street so it was kind of a novelty within the three-year period I was like, oh, there's another mime. And that was very heartbreaking. 
not knowing what to do and for no other reason i mean i was just a friend of mine that was a street magician invited me to the magic castle i lived nearby there so i knew about it i knew it was a cool looking building from the outside wanted to see the inside i went in there and i just looked around and i said i love this place it just feeds into my loving historic buildings and strange little things going on around i said i really need to work here this isn't my place so I called the Magic Castle the next day. I had a lot more guts back then. <laughs> and I said, I, um, hi, I'm a mime and I would like to find out about working at the Magic Castle. And it was actually Bill Larson at the time, the guy that started it. That's how far back this goes. And he was very kind. He said, well, you have to be a magician to, um, to, to work here. And I just said, well, I'm a mime. <laughs> Not close enough. No. So I just said, well, what do I do? And I knew a few friends that were magicians, street magicians. And I kind of started poking around to see how I could possibly put magic into my act. Well, I had a, pr a pre-skill already that I could cross my eyes in a really strange way. And I figured out how to make that into an act, like a multiplying eyeballs act. So I just kind of put all that stuff together. It's my logic that was working for me there. And my desire to say, I got to get into this building. What I, I'll do anything to get into this building. So I had a lot of help from friends. I was fortunate to know a few magicians that were very helpful and fig figured out how to use my eyes, how to multiply eyeballs and zombie floating eyeball, all these dumb little things. And I got accepted barely because they, there was a few uh, judges that, said that I wasn't enough of a magician. But then there was the other magicians that were fascinated by the idea that I was putting mime and magic together. So I did that. And after a few years, when I was starting to be, you know, my 30s, mid 30s, I realized that that little doll act, it was like a little wind up doll type of thing. And that that really was scaring me to think that that was going to be my future. I, I could see it as my past, but to be 30, 40 years old, doing a, a little girl act was pretty scary, especially after Right around that time, I saw the movie, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Do you remember that from sure. Betty Davis being, <laughs> that's the scariest movie I've ever seen. <laughs> I said, that can't be me. I can't do that. So that's when I started thinking, what I, and it was a really rough time because I knew that I, that that didn't have a future, but I didn't know how to do anything else. So I, uh, I think all these, any, any act, any routine that we come up with has to be a result of connecting a lot of dots, but it takes a long time. To, do, to know that you're even connecting the dots. And I think that over those few years that I was really upset, I mean, seriously, like not in a good place, thinking, what am I gonna do with myself? That I, Cause that's all I know how to do and I'm getting older. So a lot of things came together at uh, different times. And finally it started gelling and with a lot of support, I kind of found all the elements to bring it all come together. So are we now to a place where we could just chat about Mop Man and how that right you- there, we're right there. We're we right walked there. right up to it, but just <laughs> well, to, uh, I walked yeah. right in. <laughs> How did that come I about? Could, okay, first of all, I knew I couldn't do the doll act anymore, right? What can I do that's ageless? So I don't have to think about having to completely change everything every few years. Well, characters, cleaning lady character, that can work anywhere. And, and it's people associate with that. And it's uh, also it's the idea of a cleaning person is someone you don't really want to pay attention to because you want your place clean. So I, I like the idea that... I, I could be somebody that would be finally find a place, find love, you know, which is so not, and like the romanticism. So I knew that that was a good point for me to start with, but how do I turn that into an act? Then over time I saw, I, and the other, actually the other, I, uh, Betty Dave, that was the scariest movie I ever saw. Then the most important movie in my life I ever saw was the, the first Rocky show. There's a scene where Rocky meets Adrian. Adrian has, um, she wears glasses and she has this hat. The scene where he takes off her glasses, he takes off her hat and she shows and shows her how that she's really beautiful underneath that. Total goosebumps when I saw that. But again, it didn't it registered, but I knew that that had some meaning to me. Let me let me kind of go back a little bit. I've always been a, a little bit uh, worried about being on stage as myself. You know, be, hiding behind a mask is, was good because I didn't really think that anybody would ever want to look at me. So how was I going to get to a point where I would look okay? Well, I thought if I start as a really homely cleaning lady and I end up like in the evening gown, then I go from really ugly to not so ugly. You know, in other words, I don't have to run out on stage looking really beautiful. And then where do I go from there? I just rather start and then have an involvement. So the idea was to evolve it. Uh, okay, good. So how do I do that? Part of this whole process was that I was in Las Vegas and I saw a, a strip act of a, a woman 
um, that she took a coat and put it on her shoulder and kind of improvised a hat. And th that side became a man and the man began to like remove her clothing. So that was two characters. I'm a mime, great. I love body division. And then that's where the fun for me began is because I really got to use my mime techniques to do that. Then of course the magic was the least, was my weakest point. And thankfully I'm married to Mike Caveney. So that helped me there. <laughs> and I also had other magicians around that were just, you know, the, the magic world is great. It's great anyway, but when they see someone who's really interested that already has existing skills, I just was very, had really good fortune to know a, a good amount of great people that were willing to work with me on this. You were also so, influenced by Kenny Raskin, weren't you? Yes, absolutely. The stripper made me interested in the technique, although the and then when I saw Kenny in uh, 1984 at a mime festival, he brought the emotional side of it to it, to the idea. And I still hadn't thought, and in my case, it wasn't quite a love story that hit me right away. In fact, the other character with the mop, well, with a coat was going to be my alter ego. That was my kind of first thought. But romantic is a lot more, more relevant. I think a big, my big word in performing, coming up with a routine or an act, it needs to be relevant. People need to understand what you're doing and they need to be affected by it emotionally. And if you don't get those two things, you, you could be the greatest artist in the world, but if you can't make that connection. So I found that if I turned it into a romantic story and with Mike's suggestion, like, like a Cinderella story, then that could be something that everybody could relate to. But yeah, there was all these little things that came together, not at once. I, I had only planned on doing that act for about three years, and I'm on my 34th year now. <laughs> it just kind of, it wouldn't leave me, <laughs> which is nice. I'm grateful, but um, I, I really wish that I knew the formula of that. I mean, I know it, back thinking I know the formula. I wish I could think forward because I would love to be able to do more things like that. You mentioned connecting the dots, which I think is kind of a theme with you. Yes. Uh, and I think a lot of times... We can only connect the dots in retrospect. We're not you seeing. As, that, you know, that came from a Steve Jobs uh, speech. That's where I got the term. And that's exactly what he says. You can't, you can't form them yourself. So you just have to notice them. You have to, every time something happens to you, the, the, I like the word goosebumps here, where, where you just get this feeling that if that means something to you, then, then there's a possibility that you can transfer that. If somebody tells me that they saw my act and they got goosebumps, um, that makes gives me goosebumps. I mean, it makes me feel really good. So I want to see if I can transfer things that make me feel really good to others. And I think that's been as, as varied as my theme and my interests have been. My interest, my deep interest is to find things that make me feel good and then me find a way of having other people feel good. And that's why I teach yoga now. I, I, that, that is my outlet now is that that's my way of expressing how I can share my joy. Sharing your joy is such a great, that's a great night. Yeah. Although joy is kind of a light, a, a word of, I like, it's stronger than joy, you know, sharing the feeling yeah. because jo um, there's different kinds of feelings and not always joy, but still it ends up being, I guess the general term is joy, the, yeah. the love of life, which I guess is what I want to um, share. You know, a, a lot of magicians, not all of them, but a lot of magicians rely on uh, their verbal skills, patter, yeah. uh, storytelling, uh, yeah. and you did uh, your act completely silent. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you talk to, to us just a little bit about yeah. the power of silence and why that Well, works? I'll tell you why I do it, because I have, I have, not so much now, uh, a lack of speaking skills. <laughs> I just found more difficulty using words, and I was, you know, the major introvert that I just spent a lot of time by myself, but I had a really strong a desire to express myself and without words. When I first saw Marcel Marceau when I was 12 years old, I had no idea I'd become a mime someday, but I knew that that really grabbed me. I said, I feel that. Some people have, would have a real difficulty. I would have a difficulty if I had to come up with a speaking thing. And I, you'll never see me do a speaking magic trick ever. I tried it. It was traumatic. <laughs> so a lot of it has to do with necessity or, or just, you know, DNA. I don't know. But yeah, I wish I could do talking stuff. I really do. That, that would widen my, my thing, but it's not me. And, and I, and in fact, I was even doing lectures for magicians for a while and I just would stress out so much and I'd feel so bad that I just couldn't, couldn't go through with it. You, you two are an interesting pair because you're married to a man who's <laughs> highly verbal on stage. I uh, know. It's a really interesting contrast. It is, but we have kind of the same energy and the same appreciation for each other. 
in our relationship, yeah, he does took more of the talking. He does, yeah. I'll say I mean, I'm thinking this one through. Yeah, I, I, and I think words a lot, but I, it, it doesn't occur to me to let them out. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just don't think about, and it isn't pay, people. Some people just like, have this ability. I talk now because I'm being asked to, but I would never start this. I would never say, hey, I want to tell tell you guys this, but and it makes me feel good that you guys ask me because it's good for me to do it because I just don't do it that much. Well, we're happy to help you. Yeah. <laughs> you are you are That's a great a, help to me. No, seriously, I'm not. It's a joy for that. us. Yeah, it's a joy for me too. I appreciate that that you're interested. Jim talked about the the value of silence, but you also have some really lovely um, music choices. Yeah, that you've made throughout the routine. How did those come mm -hmm. about, and have they changed a lot? On Mopman, no. Once I I lock in, it takes me a long time to find. I'll I have like done I've done three pieces, like three silent pieces, and Mopman's been the one in the middle, the one that's kind of my identity. I'm driven by music. It's I really thought my whole life I was going to be a musician, uh, and I didn't know what instrument yet, but I ended up with a guitar when I was 12, and kept that going till my 20s. Uh, with some interruptions because I got practical and realized that being a guitarist wasn't exactly a, a sustaining, probably a sustaining thing. So I did have regular, a couple of regular jobs in between. So the music from Mott Man, uh, it's a guitar concerto. And it's a guitar concerto that I used to, I didn't play it, but I used to listen to it a lot. And so I use that at the beginning, of course, the opening of it is Frank Sinatra singing fairy tales can come true. So that pretty much those words define a whole act. Fairy tales can come true. It could happen to you. That was the idea to produce it. And then, then it goes into uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind music because it's like a scary because that's when Mottman finds me to wake me up. And then the rest of the music is this beautiful guitar concerto that I always wanted to play. I just never did. We <laughs> talked to John Carney a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah, um, that's great. He talked about, you know, that his focus is on honing and perfecting, honing and perfecting. That's mm -hmm. that's his secret. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't necessarily have to, I don't hack things off. I'm just sanding. I'm just always sanding. Yeah, yeah. Can you think of any moments from Mop Man that over the um, years you've, you've really just perfected to where you saw little subtle changes? Uh, all the time, because the, the audience reaction is going to be slightly different in different places. Also, people would give me little ideas here and there, and then... The best, the biggest idea that was uh, actually a gift from David Copperfield, unexpectedly, I mean, in a nice way. Uh, I was in Atlantic City and he was performing somewhere else and he was doing a show and he came to saw Mottman for the first time. At the very end, he, he's, he just came, it was really such a touching moment. He goes, that's a beautiful act and I wanted to cry, but I didn't. So you need to end it so that people want to cry. They want to feel something. And I go, yeah, sure. Um, how? <laughs> And he showed, he demonstrated this to me, like, well, how about at the end, if Mott Man turns his head towards you and kisses you? And I went, oh my God, yes, that's, I, yeah. And um, Don Wayne, thankfully, who's a master of making things come to life, was there. Long story short, Don Wayne's, yeah, we can make that happen. So yes, that was probably the biggest change I made that, that enhanced the act. Uh, so it was just a little thing that, you know, David hadn't even thought about it. He just kind of mentioned it like, oh, um, yeah, why don't you have him turn his head and kiss you? And that's how it, that was the, the new ending. So that was big. Uh, Jeff McBride was, um, I was doing the flower, the flower that goes in my ear. And Jeff McBride said, why don't you get, use a, a duster, a feather duster. And then that becomes a bouquet of flowers. Duh, is how, you know, because you see old magicians would use feather flowers that look like feather dusters. So, and again, you talked about honing a moment ago. You have to hone things so that they're understandable, especially in a quiet, a silent act. I can't explain anything. I have to, everything I do, every move I do has to be understood or otherwise it's a waste of somebody's time, you know. Can you think of a moment where there was confusion early on where you had to adjust? Yeah, there was a couple of things when, um, and I, where Mottman's trying to ask me if I want to go for a walk with him, you know, and I do this thing with my fingers. And I, it was a matter of how I was holding my hand that wasn't making it clear. And um, yeah, there, and there was just certain things that I have to clarify to make sure. I remember you saying at one point that one of the motivating factors behind creating that persona was you felt there's there are people in the world who we simply don't notice who we should yeah and this yeah. is a person who is not noticed right and we should notice this and i will say that i have never not noticed them since when i see the carts and i see them and i immediately think oh, of you yeah. and think of what they're yeah. going through it, that was an indelible thought but i also yeah. look at the cart on a more 
practical level because I picked you up at the airport and we got you to the St. Paul <laughs> Hotel. And that act packs into a, a reasonable size case. I mean, it was, yeah. it was very easy to get you in and out, which is, I'm, you know, that's the least of the problems, but sometimes that can yeah. be the most of the problem. Uh, yeah. It probably helped that it was that way for traveling internationally with it. Well, here, the story on that is that I, I was, I went to a cleaning, a janitorial supply store to get ideas. And I walk in there and there's this Rubbermaid cart that actually comes apart. I mean, I, when I saw those screws in there, I go, oh, this is so great. And the woman that was working there just couldn't figure out why I was so excited about that. <laughs> I said, can I sit in this? And she goes, yeah, cool. she, we finally, she, I, she finally got, got what I was talking about. So she, she was really cool. She was very helpful, but I'm sitting on this cart and I'm looking, how does this thing come apart? You know, I didn't care how it worked. I just want to know how it came apart. <laughs> so do you have any advice for someone who is thinking about trying to connect the dots themselves and come up with a routine that they can perfect and hone? If I knew, I would have 20 different acts and I'd have a one and a half hour, one woman show. If I really knew the technique that I feel and back, back engineering. Yes, I figured it out. But I do know is that, um, you know, when someone says, if you can dream it, you can do it. I, I hate that. No, you have to dream it. You can't do it if you don't dream it. But that doesn't mean you can do it. If you dream, it's just a dream. That's just like that. It takes a lot of perseverance. And it takes a lot of not so much belief that you can do it, but such a strong desire to do it. And it takes, you need to be around really people that are smarter than you, but they need something. You can't expect a smart person to help you unless you have something to show them that inspires them to help. So the, the work has to be there. And I think some people think, you know, as performers, when we do our acts, we make it look easy. We have to, because if we make it look hard, then you don't, you know, I don't want to put the audience through the stress of somebody thinking that I'm doing something that's hard that takes away from their joy, so to speak. Mm. So it just takes a lot of not giving up and not giving up on yourself because rejection is like 90% of it all. But I think that's beautiful because that makes me think more. And yeah, I think 90 to 99% of anything that I've asked artists that I really highly respect. And I get that kind of same answer. Yeah. 90, you're seeing 10% or less than 10% of what I've worked on. Things get rejected, but everything gets that you have to learn from what gets rejected. So pretty much just deal with rejection. Be, don't be afraid. Just, just dare to get out and fail. And uh, I would say that your act has a very powerful emotional wallet that, you know, is rare uh, to see on stage uh, that isn't in a, a piece of uh, dramatic theater. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you go to a magic show, uh, it's not always possible to bring an audience to tears, yeah. Um, yeah. but you have that potential. And so uh, while well, you may think, I wonder if I should have concentrated on one thing, that yeah. is something that you well, put that, some focus yeah, that's me. You. Yeah. And so that really comes through and it's very, 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 very powerful for an audience. And, and mm -hmm. so somebody who may be focused on one thing wouldn't mm -hmm. give us the emotional yeah. whack. And I think, I think you hit, hit the nail on the head is it, it's powerful. It's powerful to me um, that we all, we all have that power in us, some kind of power. It just takes a lifetime to discover it sometimes. Yeah. You know, sometimes you think of power as like, ah! and that fits some people. Some people come out like with a, you know, some machine gun, I mean, a, a performing machine gun and it works great. Other people try that and it doesn't. So I think it's a discovery of, of who we are and then be able to feed on that. And that's what I've been trying to do, but I've never had, never satisfied, which is fine with me. I think I'd be really bored if I got satisfied. So I'm always struggling to find the next way of expressing myself with whatever tools are around me that I can, can utilize. So it's a constant learning. I've, I have this constant sense of curiosity. And if you're curious, then nothing else is going to get in your, you know, it's bored. If you allow yourself to be bored, that's where you start going into that downward cycle. And I'm thankfully, I just find so many interesting things in life right now that I'm going to explore. She continues to find new things to do. Uh, if you follow her on Instagram, she and Mike Caveney travel the world. She plays her harp. She plays ukulele. She's into yoga. She's just a really fun and fascinating person. And, and wasn't that fun talking to her? Yeah, it was a delight. And I'll tell you, I'm a huge Rocky fan. 
there's so many moments in the original Rocky, which, by the way, won the Academy Award in 76 for Best Picture. Uh, but that moment that she's talking about there, when Adrian goes from this sort of geeky, who would want to... Yeah, Mousy to this gorgeous Talia Shire, obviously, uh, is terrific. And uh, she to find it's great for me to hear another performer say, I saw that and I went, ah, there's something there. And I could use it because I love sort of repurposing things yep. or it, it, finding inspiration somewhere and going, oh, I could do something like that over here. It, it, it reminds me of something our friend Joe Calloway says all the time. And, and Joe Calloway is obviously not involved in, in magic. He's involved in the business world. But a phrase that he uses a lot in consulting is, what's your version of that? Yeah. You see something successful, something that works, and you ask yourself, what's your version of that? You don't have to copy what they're doing, but they're doing this. What is your version of that? And I think that's what you're, what you're talking about when it comes to the way she assembled this entire routine was, yeah. like she said, connecting the dots and, and going, what's my version of that? Uh, she's also in a unique position, I think, in that people like David Copperfield uh, weigh in. Uh, yeah. McBride, I mean, two really terrific performers, uh, insightful, bright. Copperfield has that sensibility of, of making a story out of something magical, which was what Tina did. And so for him to offer that piece of advice, how about this? You I mean, that's terrific stuff. Yeah, exactly. So really appreciate Tina uh, spending the time with us. She uh, as she said, she doesn't, she's not an outgoing person. And um, she said it was valuable for her to talk to us, but I think it's really more valuable for us to be able to talk to her. I agree a hundred percent. And what, it, I mean, just so, she's so perfect with what she does, but now to, and then to hear her talk and how uh, sort of self-effacing she is and, uh, you know, shy about, it's just charming to me, the whole thing. And it, and it just plays into how well that mop man act really works. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. The reason we're here, of course, is to listen to the next chapter of uh, The Ambitious Card. So let's just quickly recap what happened last time. If you remember in chapter 18, Eli discovered he had no script for Nathan's show. So he had to work with Harry to put something together overnight. Max talked a little about uh, Di Vernon uh, before Eli went to do the show. Eli discusses the idea of flourishes with Deirdre and the one ahead principal and sort of suggests that uh, her husband, homicide detective Fred Hutton, visit Michael, the clerk at the record store, because it seems like Michael has motive, means, and opportunity to have been doing all these killings. Uh, then Eli goes and does the kids show. And as he's leaving, he gets a text from Megan. And that takes us into chapter 19. Let's go. The Ambitious Card, an Eli Marks mystery. Chapter 19. The sky had turned silver gray, and it looked like the snow that had been threatening for days was finally going to arrive. I pulled my car into the Wabashaw Cave's virtually empty parking lot and parked next to the only other car in sight, Megan's small green Mini Cooper, which was parked slightly askew near the front entry. The main door to the caves looked closed as I approached it, and then I noticed that it was propped open with a worn red brick which matched the cobblestone-style walkway that led from the parking lot. It took a few minutes for my eyes to adjust to the dark foyer, which was lit only by a small bare bulb from the box office window, which was shuttered. The main room straight ahead of the lobby was completely dark, but I could see some light to my right down the corridor to the bathrooms. I turned and headed in that direction. Megan, I said, momentarily surprised at the echo that bounced off the walls as I moved toward the light, which appeared to be coming from up ahead and around the corner. I remembered that chamber as the one where I'd had makeup applied before the fateful television broadcast with Gray. I moved more confidently toward the light and turned into the large cavern. The room was lit by a single light, an old-fashioned beer sign showing a smiling bear touting the benefits to be found in the land of sky blue waters. The flowing stream in the two-dimensional sign actually produced the illusion of motion, casting a shimmering light throughout the room. This provided a slightly festive look to the cavern, but did little to cut the murk that emanated from the dark corners. 
Even though she was heavily silhouetted in the dim light from the beer sign, I recognized Megan standing behind the far end of the bar. I moved toward her. Thanks for the intriguing invitation, I said, as I ran my hand across the smooth, cold surface of the bar. I mean, I like the mood lighting and all. Eli, she said. If I'd been really listening, I would have heard the stress in her voice, but I was already on to the next subject. Well, you'd be happy to know that not only did I just have a great show, but I may have also cracked the murders, I said, as I arrived at her end of the bar. I pulled up a stool and sat down as I looked at her. The shimmering water in the beer sign was doing interesting things to her face, making it look as if she were crying. Turns out, Ariana's assistant, Michael, was killing all the psychics to direct attention away from his desire to get Ariana out of the way. The ambitious card was just a flourish to hide the real trick he was doing. Megan shook her head sadly. No, she said quietly, that's not it. Well, I might be off on some of the details, I admitted, but I think I have the general concept figured out. Yes, you do, said a voice from behind the bar. I looked around, surprised to hear another voice, but didn't see anyone. And then Pete, who had been crouching behind Megan, slowly stood up. He was holding a gun, and it was pointed at Megan. You've got the concept right, Eli. You're just a little off on your identification of the players. I looked from Pete to Megan, and for the first time, I saw the fear in her eyes. And finally, moron that I am, I recognized that it wasn't just a trick of the light from the beer sign. She actually was crying. Hey, buddy, I said to Pete, trying to sound as affable as possible. Take it easy. If you handle that gun the way you handle a deck of cards, someone's going to get hurt. Thanks for the advice, but I'm actually counting on someone getting hurt, he said as he took Megan's arm and pushed her out from behind the bar. He clutched her tightly as they rounded the corner and stood in front of me. And thanks for responding to Megan's text messages, although you've probably figured out by now that I sent them. I nodded as the other shoe dropped and I realized where I had screwed up. Abbreviations, I said, shaking my head. That's what was wrong. Pardon me? I should have realized that the texts weren't really from Megan. There were no abbreviations. Pete looked from me to Megan. He actually looked hurt. My wife and I don't text each other, he said, because she told me once she didn't like it. But apparently she really likes texting with you, he said making it sound almost kinky. He gestured toward a small silver flashlight resting on the bar. Pick that up and turn it on, he said. I did as instructed. You know, Pete, if this is about Megan and me, I think you're blowing it all out of proportion. Don't worry about that, Eli, Pete said. Your relationship with my wife is just icing on the cake. Now, head over that way. He gestured with the gun toward the darkest corner of the room. I turned and pointed the flashlight beam ahead of me. The ceiling sloped down as we got closer to the far wall, and in the dim light of the flashlight, I finally saw a door set back within the murk. It was nearly the same color as the cavern walls, making it practically invisible until you were right on top of it. I heard the rattle of keys and turned to see Pete tossing me a key ring. I grabbed the ring out of the air. Unlock the door, he said flatly. There were two keys on the ring. I focused the flashlight on the door with one hand while trying one of the keys with the other. The first key didn't fit at all. The second key slid into the lock roughly, and on my initial attempt, it refused to turn. I gave it a hard twist and could feel the vibration of the old tumblers in the lock as they slipped into place. I gave the handle a hard tug, and the heavy, solid door swung open slowly. The space on the other side looked even darker and danker than the room we were in. Go in, Pete said. I stepped into the pitch-black space and turned to see Pete pushing Megan in ahead of him. 
She stumbled up alongside me, trembling. I wanted to put a comforting arm around her, but under the circumstances, I felt it was best to wait and see how this played out. I held up the key ring. Pete shook his head. You can hang on to that, he said. You'll notice that there's not a lock or even a doorknob on this side of the door, so the keys will do you little good, but they will at least explain how you were able to get in here. I pointed the flashlight toward the door and saw that he was correct. An old rusted metal plate was welded to the door where a lock and door handle should have been. I'll take that flashlight now, Pete said, holding out a hand to me while he kept the gun in his other hand pointed in my general direction. I handed it to him, and he stood back, partly closing the door, holding just a small opening with his left foot. Don't want to let too much air in here, he said. Sorry about the gloomy setting, but it was the best I could do under the circumstances. The pattern must be maintained. The pattern? Sure, you know, the psychic with second sight stabbed through the eyes, the hypnotherapist who is murdered in his sleep, and on and on, and now the psychic who works with crystals is found dead in a cave full of them. And as an added bonus, the murderer dies along with her. So you're going to lock us in this room? I asked. Well, yes, but to the police... It's going to look like you accidentally locked yourselves in this room, he said, putting an odd emphasis on the last word. But what's interesting is that this isn't a room, is it, Megan? She shook her head slowly. No, it's not. What is it? It's the entrance to the rest of the caves, the part that's not open to the public. That's right, honey. It's the rest of the caves, a few miles of tunnels and nooks and crannies, and maybe even a couple places where one could fall from a great height and do considerable damage. And you know what's interesting about these caves? He asked. Neither of us answered him. I couldn't see his face. He was silhouetted by the dim light coming from the cavern behind him. What's interesting, he continued unabated, is that over the years, the St. Paul Parks Department has systematically sealed off all the outside entrances to these caves, you know, to keep bums and homeless people out. However, every few years, someone finds another way in, and they wander about for a while. And then you know what happens? Again, we stared back at him, unwilling or unable to answer. He didn't seem to mind. They die, he said. They die because all the entrances are closed up and there's no air. And before they know it, they're only breathing carbon monoxide. Only they don't realize that. And a little while later, they get tired and fall asleep and die. Which essentially is what's going to happen to the two of you in the next hour or so. My mind was doing its best to figure out what was going on, but I couldn't make all the pieces fit. This can't just be about me and Megan, I said finally, because there was no me and Megan until well after Gray and Bitterman were killed. So if it's not about us, what is it about? Real estate, Megan said in almost a whisper. It's all about money and real estate. Bingo, Pete said. Real estate, I repeated as I looked around the dark space. Really? Not this real estate, Megan said softly. Not the caves. My corner. The stores. Here's something interesting, Pete said as he leaned casually against the doorframe, still holding the door open a bit with the toe of his shoe. When Megan and I were in couples therapy, I learned that finances are the one thing that couples are most likely to argue about. He looked over at Megan. And that certainly is true in our marriage, wouldn't you agree? Megan didn't say anything in reply, but I could sense her fury just below the surface. When Megan inherited all that property from her grandmother, Pete continued, I was all for unloading it. In fact, I even found a consortium that was looking for a corner just like ours, 
and they were willing to pay well above market price to get it. Unfortunately, my dear wife, and I should point out, you are still my dear wife, as no divorce papers have yet been signed, wanted to hang on to it for what she called sentimental reasons. She said I could sell the caves if I wanted, but not her precious corner. So this is all about money? I asked. Not just money, Eli. A lot of money. The consortium's plan was linked to federal money for a new light rail line and some state money for new housing and some city money for park improvements. We're talking millions here for the right developer. They were looking at several locations, but ours was favored. But I couldn't get Megan to sell. So you had to get rid of Megan, I said. Yes, as it turned out. But in reality, nothing would probably have happened if I hadn't bumped into Gray in the parking lot after his show with you that night here in the caves. We'd crossed paths before, and so we started chatting. He knew about the consortium and said he was putting together his own plan to bring to them, including ideas for another location. I needed time to convince Megan and didn't need that old faker screwing up my plans, so I followed him home. You stabbed him and used my playing card as the flourish. Pete shrugged. It was right there in his pocket, so I figured, why not? Then at the reception, after Gray's memorial, Bitterman started talking about a meeting he was supposed to have had with Gray. I couldn't take the chance that he was putting together his own deal, so I got some rat poison from the car, emptied out a couple of ibuprofen capsules, refilled them with the poison, and put them in his sleep apnea machine. You carry rat poison in your car? Pete chuckled. I'm a real estate guy trying to unload a bunch of friggin' caves. You bet your ass I carry rat poison in my car. And because I've religiously followed the rules that you taught me, Pete continued, I also always carry a deck of cards. So I left a king of diamonds under the machine. At that point, as far as the police are concerned, there's a pattern. Someone's knocking off psychics. And you're one ahead, I said, because now if you do need to kill Megan, it will just look like one in a series. Exactly. And on the other hand, if I can finally convince her to sell the property, I don't have to kill her. And at the same time, I've successfully eliminated the competition. I guess that's what they call a win-win. I said dryly. That's exactly the way I looked at it, Pete agreed. The problem was, Megan was insisting on the divorce, and as soon as those papers were signed, there was no way I was getting my hands on the property. Then I remembered that Megan had consulted two different psychics, and both of them had, bless their hearts, recommended that we get divorced. Ariana and Franny, I said. Pete's silhouette nodded. Those would be the two. So you decided to continue the series. I needed a couple more to make sure that no one made the connection to the real estate angle, and I also needed more suspects besides you. That's where Boone came in. That boy was born to be a suspect. So how did you get Boone to go to Ariana's apartment? Didn't have to. He had a standing appointment at her place, same time every week. This gave me pause. Really? A weekly appointment? What was that all about? I have no idea, but saw no reason not to use it to my advantage, and I thought it wouldn't hurt to have you there as well. So it was you who called Franny pretending to be Boone? That was me. Know what I mean? He said, doing a dead-on impression of Boone's verbal tick. Now, I hope you both understand that the longer we talk, the more precious oxygen you're using up in here. I help things along by coming in earlier and starting a couple of fires further along in those passages, he added, gesturing toward the darkness behind us. I'd like to have it all make sense in my head before I pass out and die. Have it your way. 
So how did you get in and out of Ariana's building without showing up on the security tapes? Real estate, Eli. Don't forget what Megan said. This is all about real estate. There's a furnished unit for sale on Ariana's floor. I made an appointment to show it to a couple earlier that day. I came into the building with them, but let them leave on their own. Then I just stayed in the condo until it was time for the Boone and Ariana show. Then I took care of the two of them. After you arrived, I whacked you on the head and returned to the unit down the hall. The next day, I had another showing set up. I buzzed this new couple in, showed them around, and then left with them. Nothing out of the ordinary about that. The place is always crawling with realtors. Another pause. I wanted to keep him in with us as long as I could, but I was running out of conversational gambits. So the idea is that the police will find us in here and assume that we got locked in when I was attempting to kill her? Pete nodded. Something like that. They may find another way to spin it, but the most incriminating piece of evidence against you will be that after you die, the murders will stop. Of course, that will be because I've stopped committing them, but that's not how the police will read it. He shone the flashlight on my face and then on Megan's. He was quiet for a long moment. What a cute couple, he said. It's kismet that you found each other. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have one more loose end to tie up in Minneapolis. I'll be back in a couple of hours, he added as he stepped through the door. But I think I'll say my goodbyes now. He closed the door, and we could hear the lock snick shut. And then we were alone in the inky blackness. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So now we know who the killer is. Hang on a minute. Now we've got all kinds of pieces of this puzzle. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just say before we, uh, you know, spoilers ahead, if for some reason you haven't read or listened to The Ambitious Card and you're skipping over the chapters, uh, skip over this next section because we're about to talk about the, our killer is, here's a space, you can go away now. Megan's ex-husband, Pete, has been killing people all along and doing it the uh, uh, with the one ahead principle, uh, ri originally killed Gray for real estate reasons and then realized, hey, I've just killed a psychic. I can kill some more and then kill my soon to be ex-wife. He hasn't signed the papers yet. And uh, community property laws being what they are, all of her property will go to him. So Eli's student, Pete, not a nice guy. Not a nice. In fact, I go so far as to say a murderer. Absolutely. And he's uh, he's going to kill them in the Wabasha Caves. Now, on a more serious note, people have died in the Wabasha Caves. Yes. Um, so I put a link uh, in the show notes to one of those tragedies. I will say that I didn't know that going into the research for this, but I knew I wanted to do something in the Wabasha Caves because I kept driving by them on my way to our production of A Christmas Carol every right. year. Right. And I remember that you had done a show, a very spooky show, one of the first magic things I'd seen you do in the caves. Do you remember which cavern you were in for that? Yeah, we were in the very first cavern that was unfinished and cleaned out. So the outside cavern is actually a nightclub and has been since, you know, the 20s. Uh, it was a frequent hangout for the gangsters that would come from Chicago when the heat got too hot to hang out in St. Paul. They would go to this Castle Royale. And so the, the finished portion of the caves is a, a nightclub and they have big bands there still today and uh, give you tours. And then there are limestone caves, or sand, I'm sorry, sandstone caves that go back because they were quarrying out of there. Uh, and I think in the thirties, when they started some urban redevelopment, they ripped down houses and just stuffed the garbage in these caves. And so the folks that owned them started systematically cleaning them out. So once they had that, you know, initially I was thinking I would perform in the, in the Castle Royale portion, but when we saw the next cave over, uh, we said, no, no, this is better because when you turn off the lights in here, it's dead dark. Yeah, it was a great show, and it was a great introduction to the spookiness of the Wabasha Caves, and that is where we find uh, Megan and Eli for the next chapter or so. I will say that we only have a couple more 
chapters to go in the book. In our last chapter, chapter 18, Harry made uh, a mention of Di Vernon, uh, who's been uh, mentioned a few times uh, in the book and certainly uh, I think we've mentioned a couple of times here on the podcast. So our next two episodes are going to be devoted to Di Vernon, learning about him from two magicians who actually knew him and knew him well. Two episodes from now, it'll be Steve Spill, uh, who literally grew up around Vernon, uh, who's known as the professor in the business. But in our next episode, uh, and I know Jim is bubbling over with excitement on this. I really am. I, I'm an enormous fan of John Carney. So. Yeah, John Carney is going to talk about his relationship with Vernon and also about the, the nature and value of mentorship. I know that one of the first live magicians I saw with you outside of the corporate environment, we were at a convention here in town, was John Carney and a more affable, relaxed, yet brilliant, incredibly skilled performer yeah. you're unlikely to see. Yeah, it, it's it kind of ruined you, I would think, because you it's like that time we went to that cowboy convention and the first guy we saw was Dave Stamey. And we thought, yeah. wow, if it's all going to be like this, this is going to be incredible. Of course, it wasn't. Dave Stamey's <laughs> genius. And there were a lot of great performers, but nobody in Stamey's caliber, in my opinion. So Yes. And I just love that throwaway. So that time we went to the cowboy convention, <laughs> or maybe there, there might be a whole other podcast. <laughs> we're serial convention. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Anyway, so next time uh, we'll hear chapter 20 of The Ambitious Card, and we will talk with the the one, the only, the amazing John Carney. As I mentioned, you've got the links to Tina Leonard performing Mop Man and other routines uh, in the show notes. Anything else from you, Jim? Well, I think people, if you have not already subscribed, you you really should. Uh, and it would mean a lot to us. So um, hit that subscribe button. And uh, also, we're told uh, through reliable sources that if you rate and review us, that really does uh, help the algorithm find other people who might enjoy this podcast. So if you have a second, rate and review us as well, but certainly subscribe. Yes. And the, the best place to do the rating reviewing is on uh, Apple. And I put a link in there for that. But I, people have told me uh, when I've asked them, how did you find it? That it was recommended to them because they listen to other magic podcasts. And so the more of that we can do, uh, the more we can get this fun stuff out there. So anyway, next time, chapter 20 and John Carney. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham. Produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.